Okay, Steve, we can finally talk to you. So, hello. I, you told me once that when you were in your pre RDP days, that you were thinking, you, you would sing the praises of this band uh, to anybody who would listen. Yeah, I was a fan, definitely. And, and how did you end up hooking up with these guys after Mike left? Uh, I graduated music college, and uh, I'm from Michigan originally, wanted to uh, do something more than just teach guitar in Michigan, so I moved out to uh, Los Angeles. And uh, it's funny, I, was, I got into a band out there with a, a mutual friend of the bands, a guy that had, had been on tour with them before. And, uh, Jason Sutter. Just got to yeah. give the guys props. He's Definitely. Helped us out so many different friend, guys. friend of ours, Jason Sutter, was playing drums uh, in Letters to Cleo when they were touring with uh, Our Lady Peace. And uh, we ended up, uh, lo and behold, we ended up in a band together out there. It was kind of a, you know, we were backing up uh, an artist that had a record deal and someone no one's ever heard of. Uh, and uh, it, it, w it was an okay gig. The music wasn't great, so him and I would just get to talking, and one day we were talking about our favorite bands, and I was like, yeah, I really, I'm a big fan of Our Lady Peace. I think they're great. And, you know, he's like, oh, I, I know those guys actually. I've toured with them, this and that. And then I think uh, once stuff went down between the band and Mike, um, I think he was one of the first guys that you guys called, right? Because mm -hmm. Jason definitely, you know, he's, he knows a lot of players, uh, musicians in Los Angeles. So I think you guys gave a shout out to him, and uh, and he said, "Wow, I know this guy who's." Uh, I think one of the things you were definitely looking for was someone who uh, hadn't been around the block and wasn't bitter or anything with the music industry. <laughs> and I was definitely very green, and uh, and he said, "Yeah, I'm playing with this guy. I think would fit really well." And he also uh, has a passion for your music. So you're like Duncan. You just hopped on the tour bus. Yeah, it's pretty bad. No, he door. didn't. He jumped into the fire. I mean. Yeah. He came to he my flew, house for about a month or so first and well, tried I, him out yeah, hanging out. Flew out to Maui in front of Bob, and anyone that's seen any of those Metallica videos understands how Bob <laughs> is with guitar players. Right. So that's Steve. Put in front of the console, play the Somewhere Out There riff. Like that, I think that was it. And yeah. It, you know, it was, but that for us was, you know, if there's going to be a test for a guy, if you can kind of, if you can make it under that pressure cooker, then it's going to work out. That, that must have been wild. All of a sudden, you find yourself in Maui, in Bob Rock's studio, the guy yeah. who produced the Black Album, and... And he's a huge Metallica fan. And, and, yeah. and, and he's riding you to, to do things that you never thought you were able to do. Yeah, it's funny. I remember because I, I had come to Toronto and met Jeremy and Duncan, but I remember I met Rain and Bob at the exact same moment in a studio yeah. as they're working on a song in Maui. That was definitely a, an interesting tough. moment. He's, he's tough on guitar players, no matter... Yeah. He is a guitar yeah. player, so he's, he's like a bitter guitar player, always, like... No, I want, give me the stuff, give me the stuff. Give me the guitar, you know. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Oh, so there's Steve Are you just kidding? sweating bullets. That was the first time I met him. Three years later, I was still sweating bullets in front of the guy, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but that first record was the Gravity record. That was and big, that, again, big times for Steve, good times. That, that was, that reestablished the band after some of those, those darker two previous records into, into something, again, new guitar player, new, new producer, new lease on life. Yeah. That was fun. That that whole tour and it was amazing. And it was a great time with Steve and you know I, Duncan really injected. Um, we kind of went by it quickly, but Duncan really injected something in the band uh, on before Clumsy that we really needed as a person and a personality. And Steve did the exact same thing, you know, for all of us, and still is doing it. Well, let me just back up a second here and something I missed. And, and when did Chris? Um, or sorry, Chris, uh, Matt Cameron Chris. show up. Oh, Matt Cameron, Matt yeah. played on Spiritual, oh, spiritual. Machines. Two Just songs. at the end, Pearl Jam was in town, Jeremy was hurt, and we were trying to finish the record. What did you do? I got mugged. That's oh. right. Were you out walking your dog or <laughs> something? Yeah. Shouldn't do, Rexdale. Don't do that. Don't get mugged in Rexdale. When you're finishing a record. Yeah. So I, I had a little tibia chip action right here from the, from the uh, juggernaut of a guy. And uh, my wiener dog went running, and I went crying. <laughs> I, everything was Should've fine. That one up. I had a wiener dog at the time. That's probably why he mugged me. He's like, well, this guy's got nothing. <laughs> so, I, and I was in a position where it's like, I know this is ridiculous, but I can't play drums, and we need to do two, two songs. Yeah. And uh, we'd already booked the tour, and like, yeah, yeah, and, we had to get we them had done. To we get had to get them done, and, and they done. were ready to go. Everything, the drums were, the parts were done, and everything. So. Uh, and Pearl Jam were just coming into town, and I'm like, hey man, how's it going, Matt? What's happening, brother? What are you doing tomorrow afternoon? He's like, 
nothing. I was like, well, come on down. And, you know, he played on both songs in like an hour and a half. He's such a kick-ass drummer, and he's a great guy, and he totally saved the day. You yeah. know? And, you know, he, he's... Uh, you know, he's one of the, to me, like, uh, he, he was probably my favorite drummer in rock at the time, so it was really nice to have him kind of put his, you know, stamp on that record because, you know, we had Elvin play on the record before, so it was some nice company. You had a wiener dog? Yeah, there you go. I had a yeah, wiener dog, yeah. Two, actually. Oh. They're evil little dogs. <laughs> they are. They'll bite you. <laughs> Couldn't save you from uh, a They won't guy stop you mask. from a thug. <laughs> they will not. They will run away. <laughs> they they run ground, away. Holding your leg, and the wieners run off. Yeah. Yeah. Give me your money, not the wiener dog. All right. So, <laughs> Gravity is the Bob Rock record. It's the Steve record. It is the reset record. It goes really well. And then we move on to the next album. <coughs> it, it becomes this pattern for us. It's like success is probably the worst thing for us because it's as soon as that happens we go the opposite direction. And because I tell you, when I saw the title of "Healthy and Paranoid Times," I'm thinking, "Uh oh, that title was not taken. That that's not a flippant pick for a title." No, no. Mm -mm. It was brutal. I, you know, I, I've never been so kind of depressed being an artist for. In, you know, well, Why? Like, what was wrong? That was a really dark period, man. I took that record took even longer and forever, and we were going to six or seven different studios. Well, that was we didn't know what we wanted. Well, but the thing with the, the band, I was talking about. When you talk about like the best <clears throat> attributes of what we do, and it's it was always that that we you know we knew what direction we were going, and sometimes it took longer than others. This time was the first time in our career where we really had no direction. We had. We did at the beginning, and then we got lost. And then it got compounded by, like Jeremy said, changing studios and record company people shifting around and having another one of these big things in L.A. where they all come and all the record company people during the Grammys came and listened to what we had at that yeah. point. Halfway Walked through. Walked away, really not excited. Yeah. And we thought we were done, and Bob thought we were, you know, Bob was really excited. And, and so it just like deflated everything, and then we went and started chasing our tails with stuff, and it just ended up being this. And even though there are some really beautiful moments in that record that we're all proud of, it's 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 odd because the experience of it taints the record for us. Um, one thousand one hundred and sixty-five days from start to finish. I was drunk about nine hundred and ninety-eight of those days. Yeah, I mean it was. It was, and that, you know, Jeremy was definitely battling some demons during that record. I was, personally, with you know, just do I want to go through this hell? You know, I wrote lyrics for like forty songs. It says here forty-three I to songs. My brains out. Six thousand gigabytes of hard drive space used on this recording. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is a band that has no idea where they're going. We had so many different versions. We had some songs that have four like completely different versions of songs. That's how lost we were. We didn't even, you know, we couldn't even tell what was what we was. We basically good should have had white coats with our asses hanging out at the back because that's how crazy we were acting yeah. the whole time. It was. It was like rats. an asylum. It was like, just what's a bunch going of on? Idiots Let's with try this a new way. Let's slow it down. Let's try it in a new key. Let's do it in a and six the funny eight. thing is, you know, we were kind of closer at the beginning. Because as, as Rain we were, said, but looking back on it, we had a record. Because yeah. there, it was, there was this sort of moment where we play, as Rain said, we played the record, what we perceived to be the finished record for all the brass, yeah. and the comment was, "Hey man, great bottom end." Ooh. And and then <laughs> six months later, when we deliver the rest of the record, the whole record, a song from that original session that hadn't been changed at all was still live off the floor. Basically, they said, "Wow, that's." That's an epic song. That should be the first single, but they'd heard it six months earlier and thought nothing What of was it. the song? Future Blame. Well, it was well, Future, Future Blame. But the first single, Where Are You, was a song we never play and probably won't play anymore. There was three different versions. There was a version we did in Maui, like it was live off the floor of that, you know, the first recordings, and there's like eight songs. It's still like an EP or a thing that we all have individually. That's actually a pretty nice piece of work. It's eight songs, all live. Yeah, it was amazing. And, that, and, and we were really happy about that, but for some reason we decided that wasn't good enough. And then we made another second thing, and that's the one we played for all the cats and that weren't feeling it. So then we ended up going to a third inception. And you know, know it ended up, at the end of the day, two of the best ideas from the beginning still made it through, and eventually, you know, 
with, with that and Angels, we felt we had, you know, a record. But yeah, Angels is a sleep, one of my all-time favorite oil pieces. So there's, it's not like it's all bad, but, you know, we have, I think we're able to look at that thing really subjectively now, and it, I think for me it was profound in the sense that it really taught me and probably taught all of us that if something feels forced, don't, do it. It. don't even, like, quit. Like, put it away, throw it in the trash, and don't better forget about it. Put it out. If you feel good about something, just put, do it and put it out. Because it's never going to change. Yeah. It never cha If it feels good, it's usually still good. 